we welcome you to tonight's special event associated with Dispossessed but Defiant, which is an international photo exhibit put together in 2014 by the CJPME Foundation. My name is Brian McIntosh, I'm the minister of this church, and I'm happy to be your host and moderator for tonight's event. Before we begin any further, I would like to share the acknowledgement that we recognize the history, spirituality, culture, and stewardship of the land of the indigenous peoples of this region, including the Huron-Wendat, Patoon, and Seneca nations, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit, who are Anishinaabe people. This territory in which we stand and work is covered by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which is an agreement between the Haudenosaunee and the Ojibwa and Allied <coughs> Nations, and we seek to live in respect, peace, and right relations with them as we work, live, play, worship, and plan, and learn tonight upon their traditional territories. Made up of over 160 photos, the Dispossessed but Defiant ex exhibition downstairs in the gymnasium, if you didn't have a chance to look at it yet, depicts different aspects of indigenous people's experiences of colonization and dispossession, and their inspiring struggles to resist such colonization. Spanning over 150 years, the compelling photos of the exhibition capture the experiences of three indigenous groups, indigenous peoples in this part of Turtle Island, the Palestinians under the Israeli occupation, and black South Africans under apartheid. Our sponsors for this week-long photo exhibit downstairs, for whose support our planning group is grateful, include the Social and Ecological Justice Commission of the United Church's Shining Waters Regional Council, Kairos Toronto West, Kairos Great Lakes St. Lawrence Regional Group, and Kairos Canada, the Palestine Network of Shining Waters Regional Council, the Ontario Federation of Labour, and the Unifor Social Justice Fund. Tonight's event and tomorrow's afternoon event in recognition of it being September 30th, a National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, as well as other program pieces tomorrow morning, form the bulk of the Kairos annual regional fall gathering for our part of South Central Ontario, entitled Decolonizing Hearts and Minds. So we welcome those of you who are here for that entire conference. Maybe a quick show of hands of who's here for the Kairos conference this weekend. Quite a number of us, and more to come tomorrow, I believe. Of course, we also welcome those of you from uh, nearby churches in Etobicoke or elsewhere, or the general public, if you've heard of it, and are attending. We appreciate you being here. Tonight's public event focuses on the Palestinian struggle and features Kairos Canada's Palestinian partners who are currently visiting Canada to our good fortune. We are uh, especially pleased to have two people from the Wiyam Center for Conflict Transformation in Bethlehem with us, um, both of whom are leaders in the nonviolent struggle against the Israeli occupation. And in addition, we also have a Palestinian-Canadian author with us to share his story and how his writing uh, relates to uh, the Palestinian question. I will introduce them all more fully in a moment, but before I do that, a few housekeeping items are in order. We always have to have housekeeping items, right? Yes, we invite you to partake of our snacks during the break if you haven't already. Or linger in this space afterward. We're going to go until about 8.30 here and then open up the exhibit for you to take a look downstairs. And we hope that you will consider doing that if you haven't already. If you need a washroom, there's one just to the right of the bottom of the stairs to my left. And just make a U-turn to the right, you'll find it. 
as well as separate men's and women's washrooms through the back door directly behind me. Go through that door there and out the back and down the hall. The men's uh, washroom is half a flight down closer to you and the women's half a flight down at the end of the hall. Now please note that we have Robert Massoud, a panelist for our upcoming Thursday evening event with us tonight. And he has the Tune products for sale for our purchase uh, during and after this event and that table right over there. Robert, you can wave your hand, people can see you after the event. Uh, our format will be to hear from our guests for a time and then to engage you as our audience in a Q&A period following a break, which I'm going to be pretty strict about because we have wonderful guests here who want to hear from them. Um, as we uh, engage our energy in moving forward toward a post-colonial agenda, both here and in Palestine. And I would like now to introduce our guests. First, our two guests from Lian Center, a conflict transformation center, which is a grassroots organization established in Bethlehem in 1994 that aims to improve the quality of relationships and to promote peace and justice, a culture of acceptance, and reconciliation in the community. Hannah Tare is a researcher, trainer, and peace activist with WIA, who conducts trainings for youth and women on leadership, conflict resolution, communication, environmental awareness, and gender-based violence. She was the Middle East representative for the Women Peace Program Working Group in the Netherlands, and contributed to the book called A Force Such as the World Has Never Known, Women Creating Change. That sounds good to me. 2013 was that book, with a chapter on advocating women's rights in Palestine. Tarek al-Zubi is a Christian Palestinian American. We won't hold that against him, right? <laughs> <laughs> Your mom friends here, who was raised in the little uh, the little town of Bethlehem. Probably saying that in time too. He received a BA in economics and peace studies from Manchester University, Indiana, and an MA in international cooperation and development at Bethlehem University. Tarek currently works as the project and youth coordinator at WIAM, is active in civil society part of numerous choirs, which endears him to me, as I am as well. I'm glad to know you're a sinner. And had the privilege of being part of the World Council of Churches' 12 Faces of Hope campaign. Tarek has been with the Kairos Women of Peace program since, since its inception in 2018. And finally, our guest author, Saeed TV, a writer and lawyer based in Toronto. He was born to Palestinian parents in Kuwait and has lived in Canada since 1993. His writing frequently engages the immigrant experience and his Palestinian background. His collection of short stories, entitled Her First Palestinian, was published just in 2022 and was a finalist for the Atwood Gibson Writers' Trust Fiction Prize. Saeed's book is available for purchase at the publisher reduced price of $20 this evening, and we encourage you to consider purchasing it following this event. So without further delay, as I say, we're going to hear from all three speakers for about 7 to 10 minutes, and then we're going to have a brief break, and we're going to come back and have a dialogue. So I start with uh, Hannah. Good evening, uh, everybody, and thank you for uh, your uh, interest in uh, this event and for your uh, warm support as well. Um, there is no need uh, to introduce myself again. <laughs> and uh, first of all, I would like to say that uh, before coming up uh, into this sanctuary, uh, I had visited the uh, exhibition downstairs and really it is a, a heartbreak to see all this kind of suffering, injustice, 
and violence against people. The disposition and the displacement of people, it is really unfair for humanity and for human rights all over. Uh, for me as a Palestinian, I say that it's always there like two narratives to hear. The first narrative you hear it from one side and the other narrative you hear it from the other side. And it has been never ever that the two sides agree on the same narrative. And this has been taking us so long to reach an agreement, to reach a justice peace, because no one agrees with the other. For me as a Palestinian, I would say that my narrative is so simple, that during the British mandate, there was the Palestinian people living happily in their homes, taking care of their gardens and their kids and their families. And then they, they have been kicked out of their houses, their homes, and displaced all over the world. Now there are so many Palestinian refugee uh, descendants as well, all over the world, and in other refugee camps, in Lebanon, in Syria, in Jordan, and in their own homes as well as refugees. Because there was the Nakba in 1948, where people has been forced to leave their houses, and the Nakba in 1967, where also people had to move from one area to another to become refugee. Uh, the other narrative says that, no, we have the right to come to this land because this is the promised land, the land of honey and milk. So how can we figure this out? It is a problem. But I would say that to reach a resolution to have a, a peaceful agreement and a justice one, not only a peaceful, because we can have peace, but this peace can be just. This is what we really want. So in order to do this, I would say that we have to forget about the past. Let's forget about our narratives and say that we really extend our hands for each other to talk about the future, the future of our people, the future of women, the future of the youth. They need to live and they deserve to live in peace, in security, and in safety. Everybody talks about security. And we as Palestinians, we as women, we deserve to live a decent life, a life full of dignity, respect for humanity. Uh, for me, I work with Wean and I'm placed in East Jerusalem. I work with women in East Jerusalem. Their story is a bit different from Palestinian women in the West Bank. Of course, the, the, the suffering is there, and, but it is a bit different. I'm a Palestinian a woman from East Jerusalem as well, and I feel like other women from East Jerusalem that I work with, I feel that I am stateless. I do not know who am I. Okay, yeah. So, uh, I don't know who am I because I do not have a clear identity. I hold the Jordanian passport to travel. And I'm not Jordanian. I travel through Tel Aviv airport holding
keeping the laissez passer. And I'm not an Israeli citizen. And I can't hold the Palestinian passport because if I ask for the Palestinian passport, they will ask me to leave Jerusalem. And for me, to be in Jerusalem, this is my dream. And I won't give it up. Here comes the importance of the Women, Peace, and Security Program, which really enlightened the minds and the life of women I worked with. These women were so hungry for such activities, for such workshops, and there was a lot of success stories of these women that we were with. This is really a thank you for Kairos, for having this program, and for the six years that has been really full of uh, activities, full of new stories where women have been empowered with capacity building, leadership, and uh, reconciliation, where this is very important that women has been taught that forgiveness and reconciliation is very important. Therefore, we, we had to know that charity begins at home. And if we do not start with ourselves, with our women who believe in reconciliation and peaceful approaches, then we cannot reach a peaceful solution with our partner. I would call them partners, though. Therefore, uh, uh, projects like this, Women of Courage, really it is as its name, Women of Courage. And I'm really happy to share some, one story maybe, because I only have two minutes. Okay. <laughs> uh, one success story of a woman who has been exposed to domestic violence by her siblings. This woman, ha at the very beginning, she used to come with different colors on her face, on her arms, and she won't say anything at the very beginning. She usually wears long sleeves so that she wouldn't show. But then I noticed through the trainings that she there's something with this woman. And I kept like, Okay, nagging and saying, okay, come on, tell me what's wrong. And she said that her brother beats her because for many reasons, she, he doesn't want her to go out, he doesn't wa want her to uh, participate in activities. But then, when we talked to her and we referred her to a social worker, she was really empowered. She was able to stand very powerful in front of this violence she has been exposed to and by the end she said no to violence and she was there and she is now a human rights defender. This is a very great story. And thank you. I think my partner. Yeah I'd like to um, echo some of the thanks that have been given and specifically direct them of course towards the organizers and helpers of this venue and event and of course to the Kairos staff and office who have been partners with us long before we had the funding from Global Affairs for this program. Um, so to begin this talk I'm going to contextualize just a little bit of the reality and I apologize usually um, it's like giving you a depression Hill. Um, but I hope towards the end of this conversation uh, we can talk about some of the positive changes and I can include some of the work that we are doing at VM. Because um, there is always hope and I think if there wasn't hope, none of you would be here listening to our stories and maybe continuing to be involved in supporting this work as you do. So thank you for your continued work. So you see here three Palestinians with different citizenship, one without any citizenship, and with all that comes different rights. You have myself, a Palestinian of the West Bank, who can only access the West Bank, 
And when I talk about access here, I talk about consistent access, not access that requires you to jump through the many loopholes of the very different legal systems, including the military legal system. You have another Palestinian with Jerusalem residency who can access more of the land but doesn't have any voting rights beyond her local municipality. And then you have a third Palestinian living here in Canada who's been to Palestine once, she told me before the break, who I believe doesn't have consistent access to Palestine because he's dependent on the Israeli authorities' decisions. And this doesn't just extend to Palestinians, but it extends to those that we are officially or in some formal capacity connected to. My mother is an American, thank you for not taking that against me. <laughs> and she's been married to my father since 1990. And since 1990 they have applied for family unification, and she was denied entry in 2019 for quote-unquote, this is a literal um, citation or a reference to what the border control told her because she married a Palestinian man. We have now paid a sum of 70,000 shekels, which is close to 20,000 Canadian, or sorry, 20,000 US dollars, um, to entitle her to come into her own home, areas A and B of the West Bank only, when Israel grants her permission for a maximum of 90 days. My brother is married to a Palestinian woman who has no citizenship or residency as her family fled during the Ottomans and then her father left later before the Palestinian Authority was established and she is in that same position. But yet we're all connected. We all continue to work and strive for justice in Palestine and elsewhere. When we talk about the Palestinian population, we're very young. 70% of our population is under the age of 30 and 87% of our youth wish to immigrate. They don't wish to immigrate because they no longer like Palestine or Palestinian food. It's because they no longer see a sense of security for themselves, for their livelihood, for their families in Palestine. And of that 87%, there are of course those who wish to immigrate permanently and temporarily. But what it does is it allows this majority and this young energy and we always say the youth and the children build the future and so it seems we're building our future elsewhere if this continues in this trend when we talk about women especially young women women youth those between the ages of 18 to 35 especially those a little older from 21 to 35 they are the most educated demographic with the highest unemployment rate. When we talk about the economic system in Palestine, it has been stifled by the continuous practices by the Israeli military occupation. When we talk about moving from one area to the next, it took us around 45 minutes to get to this venue. In Palestine, that would have been a little bit longer as we go through each of the many checkpoints if we are allowed to cross them. And so when we talk about the basic freedoms, the right to movement, the right to expression, the right to build on your land, I live in Area A, which is under the Palestinian Authority's rule, and I work in Area C, which is under Israeli military occupation. And that means if I wish to build, or if the center wishes to develop its programming and needs to change its infrastructure to match that programming, it is dependent on Israeli licensing and permits which are very difficult to come by. And so we see land shrinking, population increasing, the economic situation continuing to deteriorate. The average Palestinian received 2,000 shekels which, I apologize, I'm not too familiar with Canadian dollars, so it's all going to be in U.S. dollars. Yeah. Um, but it was right around 550 U.S. dollars a month in the 1980s. Today, the average salary is still 2,000 shekels a month. But if you're able to 
receive access to work on the Israeli-controlled territories, or in Israel that now jumps up to 5,500 as a minimum and not as an average. And so when we talk about the walls, the settlements, which make for the building of a Palestinian state less viable and almost impossible, it is largely constructed by Palestinian workers because we are given the choice, and remember I said this is the depressing part, so forgive me again, we are given the choice between working towards our economic security and livelihood or working towards our dreams of sovereignty and independence. And it is difficult to work towards both. And if you go down to the exhibition, you can see that Palestine has been occupied long before Israel, but that Israel's occupation formally began in 1948, and the situation continues to deteriorate. So if having to choose between the two, it seems that one's economic security is more viable and is more helpful. But we are not hopeless. And we are not helpless. We have friends who on a Friday night in Canada are willing to leave their homes to come and be depressed by us. <laughs> right? And we have a community that continues to inspire us. And so this is part of why the M continues to work and serve the Palestinian community. We started working in 1994 with conflict resolution within the Palestinian territories and even far beyond before the creation of the wall, when we were able to traverse some of the quote-unquote borders. Through that program, we found many reoccurring conflicts and we wanted to go from being reactive is my 10 minutes up? Okay, perfect. I'll speak much quicker. Um, we were able to go from being reactive, where there is conflict mediating it, to becoming proactive. How can we mitigate and limit the rise of conflict in our communities? So we saw a lot of conflict relating to women, women's rights, relating to women receiving equal inheritance, equal say, and it's important to say that the role of women has been diminishing in our territory since the 1960s, since the 1940s. And we attribute that as a direct reaction to the deteriorating situation. There's this desire for sovereignty that has not been manifested or realized. And so when gone unconscious, it turns into the cycle of violence internally, part of this internalized oppression. And men begin to control women, Women, maybe the children, children become more violent, beat the dog in the neighborhood, the dog bites the old person, the community, and that cycle continues. So part of what we try and do is disrupt that cycle, say enough is enough. And so we work with women on social, economic, and political empowerment, understanding that if a woman isn't able to live independently, which oftentimes is related to her economic security, then she is only socially empowered in theory. We also focus on male allyship because we believe we are interconnected as Palestinian men, Palestinian women, as Palestinians, Canadians, indigenous, we're all related to each other and our liberation is tied. We work with youth because our youth no longer know who they are and they wish to leave, they're disconnected. And we believe we can build a better future for all of us without having anyone to be uprooted, especially in a history where so many have already been uprooted. And we work with citizen diplomacy. And because I'm um, lacking some time, I will say part of our citizen diplomacy is welcoming visitors, is being able to bridge across the continents, across the many divides that separate us, to say, come, see, and we know you will act and we welcome you, and we believe in reconciliation. And I will stop there. Thank you very much. I experienced in 1962 an experience in the Holy Land, not having a, a visa to Israel at the time. Uh, I was in uh, East Jerusalem, um, Jordan. And at that time, I took a shower. I had shampoo in my hair when the Israelis turned the water off. And 
of course, at that time from the hotel, one could look out over the bright lights of Israel. It was like living in, in East Berlin. It was a, 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 a real shame. But I experienced going out to Bad Leham, uh, about three miles, I guess it was, from, from Jerusalem. Uh, which of course was in Jordan, as well as the Jordan River and uh, the Dead Sea, which I tried to swim in and so on. Um, it was um, really an experience that, that uh, was, was heightened by the fact that I went to a place outside the city wall where apparently there was a cave and a, 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 a compound where they figured that Christ may have been buried within that cave. I, it was, it was um, run by a, a Palestinian Christian by the name of Matar, who very kindly offered me cool water, which was wonderful. His son studied at the Ontario oh, College of Art. Is there a question there? We have guests. Is there a question? And his son studied at the Ontario College of Art, and I got in touch with him when I came home. The following year, in 1963, he reported to me that a knock on the gate had occurred. His father went to the gate, opened it up, and an Israeli soldier machine gunned him and killed him. Thank you for uh story is heart-wrenching at the end there. Um, daily lived experience of many. Uh, and I will say that your, uh, your tourism experience is uh, probably somewhat typical of people in this part of the world who go on, uh, you know, Christian tours and so on to the Holy Land. And they're not shown the reality of the situation on the ground, right? They're shown the uh, the holy sites and the you know the the uh, uh, how do I put this the, uh, uh, the, the the places where there isn't the kind of uh, daily experience that you would see of struggle or violence or insecurity uh, or hardship uh, on the part of the Palestinians at all. And they come home and everything was wonderful, right? I mean, uh, you know. But anyway, I'll just uh, I'll ask for another uh, another comment question, John. Come on up. I know you know what you're doing with the mic, John. Be quick. Well, wow. <laughs> it's a danger. Uh, you do your comments have to do with um, that there's sort of an ignorance about Palestinian understandings in North America, for instance. But well, you must be aware, surely, that the Christian churches in North America have an almost vow of silence about the truth of what's going on in Palestine. That the Christian church in North America, in fact, has a, a pious views about the text of scripture, but misses entirely the gospel about Jesus, who said the kingdom of God is not about countries and land, and, and that ancient history that, that they try to venerate now. There's, there's such an anomaly, there's such a, a huge chasm of understanding for Christians who think through these things and was who honored the gospel of Jesus as to why Christians are so adamant in seeing just one side of this of this current earnest conflict and seeing only Israeli uh, truth and never, never seeing the truth of the Palestinians. So, I mean, there are two sides. It's a tough, it's a trouble. But we're blinded here in North America with, the, with what happens in churches, the piety. You know, you talk to the tourists, we go to follow the footsteps of Jesus, and that's what we do there. We, uh, but we don't listen to the words of Jesus or follow Jesus when it comes to uh, the truth of, of His kingdom is not a political one. His kingdom is not about um, uh, the, the, the things that, that we make our kingdoms about, which is money and power and, and uh, what, but the whole thing. Remember, there are a the majority of evangelical Christians are Trump supporters of all things. So you're, 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 you're coming up with a hard battle to try to keep Christians on something. But my question is this. What, 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 what do you three know? Thank you. What do you three know or think about 
that about the Christian church, which is so pervasive in North America, but has had such a horrible story about these truths. Thank you for that. Uh, and that's 100% true. I mean, it's no secret that the evangelical church has as its, like one of its um, driving dicta, the idea that Israel, the kingdom of Israel, has to be, um, you know, prosperous in, 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 in the land of Palestine. And, that's, and that drives it. And also, it's a, it's a very, it's a very um, powerful lobby group in the United States. Um, I didn't, if, 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 if I sounded like I was trying to oversimplify, that's not, that, that, that wasn't my intention. This, this is a multi-factor um, situation. There's many reasons why um, we only hear one narrative, or one narrative is highly privileged over, over another one. Um, that, uh, I think, from, 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 my, from, from where I sit, is more of a question of who's driving American government? who's funding American government, who's controlling American government, who are the likely presidents that you see, who, like, you know, historically people like George Bush and his father, like, like, like those are people who, you know, um, sympathize with that. But, they, but in terms of popular thought, like, the average North American person who is not necessarily part of an evangelical church, even they, you know, they have a sense of confusion. The people who are part of the evangelical church, they're like essentially, for, for Palestinian, they're it's not to say essentially a lost cause, right? Like, like their 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 dogma is such that Palestine can't exist. But ev but everybody else, those are people who are you know suffering from uh, an absence of, of, of the right narrative. In my view. <laughs> Yeah, the chicken in the house. <laughs> well, thank you again for that question. Um, I just want to add to the answer. Um, I think we oftentimes forget that the church is not infallible. And we have both good and bad. We have our partners from South Sudan, where the church is really spearheading um, progressive movements in society and helping people. But we also have a church in Canada that was promoting residential schools for the indigenous communities, or running some of these residential schools. Um, I think one of the issues for us is the church and political interests in some places run toe to toe. And I think um, I was sharing this with you before, but as a Palestinian community, we do have the word Israel in the Bible, but we do not recognize it as a political construct, we instead recognize it as the people of God. But there's one other thing, especially looking at the New Testament for Christians, how many times there were phrases along the lines of truth will set you free, give on to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. But the other thing is this truth is very important, and I think sometimes the church tries to hide the truth, when it is, some churches I should say, when that truth is not in line with its interests and what it teaches. And sometimes it does it because it is ignorant to what is happening and it doesn't know any better. But I think one of the things we learn, and I know tomorrow there will be a panel on conflict, uh, transformation, reconciliation. Um, and I want to say that in the context of our work, truth is the utmost important ingredient to a healthy and effective reconciliation process. If that truth is not out there, it's very easy for anger to fester, and anger can break down communication when it becomes the mode of expression. It can also be, anger can be that which incentivizes us to bridge, but it can also break down the communication. And so I think um, as it relates to churches, we do have a long way to go, but I think we are slowly getting there and we see in Canada so many of the churches, especially within the past couple of years, that have worked on their structures, that have worked on their policies, on what they say on Palestine and Israel so that it is in line with a greater truth, one that holds the narratives of the marginalized and the oppressed and that is more expansive than limiting. Amen. Thank you, sir.
Uh, I saw Robert's hand, so I'm going to give Robert a chance. You want to come down here, Robert? Uh, no, I think my You can be is heard, not, can you? Is it okay? Yeah. Sure. So, uh, Saeed, thank you for the title. Um, but it could also be our first Palestinian. Mm -hmm. Because it is a societal thing. And what it comes down to is this concept of narrative. And I believe the idea of narrative is actually the wrong idea to be working with. Because narrative is really built on an agenda to go someplace specific. So as Palestinians, we cannot compete on narrative. What we need to do is tell our story, our true story, which is not a narrative. Because narrative is about in, uh, injecting a certain agenda to lead people to a particular place. A true story is just to share the truth. The truth of what happened in history. The truth of today. The truth of our reasoning. What makes sense to you? What do your eyes see? A narrative is not about what do you see. It's about us, let us interpret what you see. So as much as I live in narrative and work with it as we all do, we also need to move away from the constrictions and the restrictions, limitations of narrative because the Palestinians will never compete on narrative. And we just don't have it. So if we could start Thank you. you want to hear from okay. Saeed about that? So my question is, what are we going to replace that with? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll let you... Um, so I don't want to get into sort of philosophical discussions of what, of what constitutes narrative and, 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 and not narrative. But when I say narrative, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that the narrative isn't true. Like, it 100% can be true. But a narrative can also be false. And what we see in this world uh, now is where, where, where you have so many different people with so many access to platforms, with so many different media, is a conflict of narratives all over the place. And so um, to say that my, my narrative is, is true is not novel. Everybody says that their narrative is true. It's just, from my perspective, the Palestinian narrative happens to be true. So we have to figure out how to make that narrative or if you want to call it our true story, how to make that true story more prominent, more widely accepted, more easily sp spoken about. That's why, for example, marrying it or, or aligning it with things like the indigenous narrative is the right way because it's, it's, it's something that people understand and something that most right-thinking um, people agree with. Um, whereas that kind of easy, way to tell our story, our true story, has just not been there before. Yeah, I think uh, you're right uh, that we can't really sometimes compete our narrative with the other narrative. Uh, but at the same time, we can t tell our real stories and document them because we are in need for such stories and we don't have them. They are just oral and there isn't a huge or a real documentation of these stories of our people who has been displaced, who has been uh, obliged to live under a threatening and under the uh, the violence that they have witnessed. So telling the story, documenting the story, and repeating the story is very important. There, we have to move from here and say that why should we only continue to debate about narratives that can be a truth or it can't be, but, but as you mentioned, that we know that our story is right. So let's move 
continue and move into the future, into what are the needs of our people, what, how can we really uh, talk about uh, a sustainable peace if, if we have a partner, of course. Can I just throw in the, the fact that the planning team for this entire weekend and the whole week and the exhibit wanted to uh, use this photo exhibit that talks about the three peoples that we're talking about, South Africa, Indigenous people here, and Palestinians, because it directly compares their narratives of dispossession, right? And it, it, I think that the narrative in Canada has changed rather dramatically, I would say, in the last 20 years. And since the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, of course, there's a lot of ignorance still. I mean, I'm not saying we're, we're you know, making tremendous progress, but I think that certainly the churches and uh, others have taken in the truth of, of the indigenous experience uh, of dispossession in this land and can now maybe see with a little more clear eyes and open ears what the dispossession that has occurred elsewhere is is about, you know, and what that results in in terms of oppression and hardship and exploitation and so on. So I, I think that that's why we wanted to have this exhibit in the first place, right? Is to compare these three uh, narratives uh, of dispossession and say that we still have a long way to go, both here and in Palestine. But look what happened in South Africa. I mean, they still have their challenges, right? But. They're, they're moving forward in a way that, that we hope we eventually will hear and that Palestinians, we hope, can as well. And the other thing is that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's report in 2015, and the reason they put truth first, right? 